Hello and welcome to our webinar, HMH's Fall 2020 Virtual Showcase. I'm Maggie Reagan, Senior Editor, Books for Youth at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click, click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Links to today's slides were sent directly to you from Zoom at the start of the webinar, but you can also download them at any time by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive a follow-up email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, certificate of completion, and the video recording. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Kwame Alexander, best-selling and award-winning author and the publisher of Versify, an imprint of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt books for young readers. Veronica Chambers, a prolific author, editor, and journalist. Amanda Acevedo, marketing manager, school and library at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt books for young readers. Taylor McBroom, marketing specialist, school and library at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt books for young readers. Lisa DeSaro, Executive Editor of Marketing at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, Books for Young Readers. And Amelia Rhodes, the Editorial Director of Etch, HMH's new graphic novel imprint. Amanda, take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm Amanda, and I will be one of the presenters today, but we are going to start off with Kwame Alexander. As uh, Maggie mentioned, Kwame is a New York Times bestselling author, a Newbery Honor winner for The Undefeated, and the Newbery Medal winner for The Crossover, and the publisher of Versify, among many other things. He's here today to talk about his own upcoming projects and about a special new title from Versify. Welcome, Kwame. Hey, hey. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Amanda. How's everyone doing out there? It's a beautiful day. It's a lovely day. We're all inside. Sorry we can't be face to face, but you know, that's why we got books. I don't know about y'all, but I have read so many books during this lockdown, like a book a, a, book a week. So it's, I tell people all the time, this is a writer's dream in the midst of a nightmare. You know, but hey, we're glad to be here. Um, Versify, this is our, we're going into our third year oh. and we have a lot to celebrate. Um, many of you tuned in to all of the ALA awards, banquets this, um, this past Saturday and Sunday. Um, and I was really excited to see Raul III, who received the Pure Belpre Illustrator honor for Vamos, Let's Go to Market. Um, there are going to be plenty other Vamos books coming out. Vamos, Let's Go Eat. Um, Sophia Pasternak, author of Anya and the Dragon, she received the Sydney Taylor um, Award, honor, honor Award. So that was exciting. Um, I got a little award called the Newberry Honor. Ah, that was pretty exciting. My dad was, was really thrilled. Um, I think this was more special than the, the first time, you know? And of course the biggest news and the biggest sort of celebration that we all had that day, um, it was kind of personal and special for me, was the undefeated um, Kadir Nelson, the illustrator winning the Coretta Scott King Illustrator Award and the Caldecott Medal. Oh my gosh, did you all see his speech? You've got to go on ALA's site and see his speech. His speech was in the age of Zoom during this pandemic. It was uh, filled with all of these multimedia elements. He had slides that he showed. This had to be the first time in the history of the Newberry Caldecott Legacy Banquet that 
there were slides. It had to be. So it was a historic moment. And for Kadir, because it was his first Caldecott medal. He won the honor, but he never won the medal. At the end of his speech, he had credits. Who does that? How cool is that? He had credits that were rolling. So his awesome wife, Jummy, put together that presentation. But we're excited about the undefeated, about Vamos, about Anya and the Dragon, um, about all of our books on that first list uh, that came out in the spring of 2000. I want to say 19, was it? Yeah, 19. Yeah, 19. So now what's next? Well, I've been doing, like I told you, a, a little bit of writing in London where I live. And the book that I wrote in London was a book called Becoming Muhammad Ali. And I wrote this book. Some of you may have the arcs. If you send Lisa an email, she might hook you up. But don't tell her I told you to do it. Um, I wrote it in London last year, and it's a book I co-wrote with um, James Patterson. And I don't even know how much time I have to talk, but I'll just share this quick story, and I'm sure maybe Amanda will put in the chat. Kwame, enough, move on to the next thing. But in the meantime, in between time, I did a performance in West Palm Beach three years ago, and it was for middle school students. And you know, I love performing for middle school kids. And so I found out that I would be on the, on the, uh, the schedule with James Patterson. He was gonna go on first and do his thing because you know he has the Max Einstein series and then I would go on. And so like the night before they called me, the organizers and said, Kwame, James Patterson wants to go on last. And I was like, all right, I'm just Kwame. What do I know? So we got there, 400 kids in a gym. I go on with Randy, my guitar player. Y'all know Randy, right? Right? So Randy performs, I perform. We rock, we rock the crowd, literary rock party. And, uh, and then James Patterson goes up and the first words out of his mouth are, why did they make me go on after Kwame? <laughs> Tried to tell him. So we had a big laugh over that. The next year they invited us back, this time a high school in a gym, a thousand kids, high school kids. Number one, high school kids don't like anything. Number two, we're in a gym, there are no acoustics. So this time he says he'll go on and then I get to go on. So he at least has learned from last year. So he goes on, he does his thing. Then Randy and I go on and we rock the house. You can imagine a thousand kids screaming in a gym. And so we rock it, it's on and popping. We have lunch afterwards. About six months later, I get an email saying, uh, James Patterson would like to talk to you. I've been summoned to the principal's office, apparently. So um, his editor asked me if I'm interested in doing a book with him. I'm feeling pretty flattered. That's kind of cool, right? He's the best-selling author of all time. How's that even possible? Anyway, so I was kind of busy, and I declined. I said, no, I can't do it. So then I'm in my room. I get a phone call out the blue. Hi, Kwame, this is Jim. Jim who? This is Jim Patterson. What? He calls me, and he ends up pitching me for the next 30 minutes about doing this book on Muhammad Ali, which, as some people know, who listened to my speeches. When I was 11, my dad made me read the dictionary and the encyclopedia. I hated books. I was in the garage one day, cleaning it up, and I discovered a book called The Greatest, My Life, the autobiography of Muhammad Ali. Age 11, picked it up, read it cover to cover, rediscovered my love of reading. Fast forward, James Patterson calls me all these years later and says, let's do a book on Muhammad Ali together. This was my life coming full circle. I decided to do it. It's the best book I've ever written. It comes out October the 5th, Becoming Muhammad Ali. Before he was Cassius Clay, before he was Muhammad Ali, he was Cassius Clay. This is about his entire childhood, ages nine and 16. It's all the stuff you don't know. You guys, you, you're gonna love this book, people. Yeah, I hope you read it. Now, for the main event, dun dun dun. Versify is all about changing the world one word at a time. We're all about empowering um, writers. We're all about discovering new writers and 
and giving opportunities to, to, to sort of paint their canvas for artists who've been around for a while, who've been um, practicing and honing their craft and, and becoming experts at, at the work that they do. And, and Veronica Chambers is an expert. She's an author. She's an editor. She's edited some pretty profound books like The Meaning of Michelle, which was a collection of essays about the former first lady. She edited a book about Beyonce called Queen Bay, a celebration of her power. Um, her first book, I feel like this is your first, this was your first book. Her first book was called Mama's Mama Girl. Mama's Girl. Am I right? Yeah. It was called Mama's Girl. It was a memoir. And that came out in the 90s. Was it the 90s? It was the 90s. I got that book on my shelf over here. That came out in the 90s. So she's been, she's been a cultural stabilizer for a while. She's been a force in the literary field, children, young adults, adult, trade, nonfiction, fiction. She's a true Renaissance woman. And here's how I know it. How many authors who've written children's book, adult books, have won a James Beard Award. I mean, come on. Do y'all even know what James Beard Award is? Y'all eat, don't you? Well, you should know. A James Beard Award is like the, the creme de la creme of cookbooks. So she won a James Beard Award for best cookbook for her book, Yes Chef, with the famed restaurateur and chef I think he has a restaurant called Red Rooster, which I've been to a couple times in London and in Harlem. Marcus Samuelson, please welcome the author of Finish the Fight. Yeah, yeah, from the New York Times, my friend, Veronica Chambers. Hi, Kwame, I'm so excited to be here. Woo, I'm so Best excited. Best of the year for me. <laughs> Best uh eyewear of the year for me wow look at you so fly <laughs> just trying to be like you <laughs> so you were born in panama right yes i was and raised in brooklyn yeah so i was raised in brooklyn let's see how far we were from each other i was in crown heights on president street between new york and brooklyn avenue that's not far yeah i grew up on ocean avenue between over by glenwood yeah I used to roll that way all the time. Well, so you're, you're pretty young though. So you're, you gotta be in your thirties and uh, I'm pretty old. So I was probably older than you. Nah. But we're excited to have you here today to talk about Finish the Fight. I got a couple of questions for you. Um, I'll just start throwing them out and we'll see where it goes. And I'm sure some of our librarians may have some questions too. Yes, um, love librarians. Changed my, did, changed my life. Tell us how that how librarians changed your life. Give me that quick story. So when I was growing up, I came, I actually lived in England when I was little. We went from Panama to England. And people are always like, what's your accent? Like, I'm like, it's Panama to Northern England to Brooklyn. So, you know, it's a little mixed up. You don't know where I'm from. But, um, you know, my parents were hardworking immigrants. They had like 10,000 jobs. And there was a Rutland Road um, branch of the library. And I just used to go there after school and the librarians would just hand me books. They would, you know, like I didn't even know how to really work a library. Like we sort of take it for granted that you walk in, you know what the sections are. They spent so much time with me. And I remember like I was, I was borrowing like 10 books a week, pouring through them. And, um, and at, at one point I got really afraid and I just sparred one book. And the librarian said, this isn't like you, like what's up? And I said, I've been counting the books in the children's section and at this rate, I'll be done by next year. And that's when I understood. And then she said, new books come out all the time. You can keep reading. And so, you know, I mean, that's life changing, right? That's pretty powerful. And that's the kind of work that you know, is required of children's book authors. It's not just entertainment, it's intelligent entertainment. You're really impacting the lives of young people. So I'm curious, we all know about Susan B. Anthony and Sojourner Truth, and you know, we're familiar with the women's suffrage movement. What, what was the inspiration behind you writing, behind you doing Finish the Fight? Tell me how that came to be and what do you hope, you know, kids get from it? Sure, so for the last couple of years at the New York Times, 
I've been working on an, in, on an initiative about photography and history. It's been super fun. And so one of the things when you're looking at history, you always look at anniversaries. And we knew that the 100th anniversary of the centennial, centennial was coming up. And I asked myself and my team, what do we know about suffrage? And it turned out not a lot. So one of the things that I love about being a journalist is to me, the thing that kind of gives you the through line of being a kid is that you get to ask questions. So if you know that you don't know a lot about something, you ask questions. So we convene this round table of historians, people like Erica Armstrong Dunbar, Susan Ware, Martha Jones, Kate LeMay, and we just asked them, we spent four hours just asking them questions. And at the end of it, the thing that I think for me solidified the whole project is two things. One, I realized that the word suffrage is kind of boring, right? It's like, it sounds like suffering. <laughs> it sounds boring. But the thing is, is that the kind of jumping off point for us is that it took nearly 150 years from the early women's rights conventions in the 1800s to this 1920 suffrage anniversary to 1965 and the Voting Rights Act. And what suffrage really is code for, you know, you talk so much about language and poetry and I love your work. Suffrage is really shorthand for women who are badass political strategists and that generation after generation, they kept going and changed the world. You know, really by 1920, some of the suffragists are third generation. That's pretty powerful, you know? And that's wow. when I felt like we had to do it. I kind of feel like that should have been the tagline on the book. It should have been badass political strategies. Like, there it is. Can we say badass to kids, though? I don't know. No, you can't. No. We we'll can't really in the New York Times. They don't, they don't love that language. I'm right. like walking into a meeting and saying, that's badass. And they're like, no, no. <laughs> Did you have trouble picking which women to feature? And could you name a few that you featured that? many of us don't know about. Sure, can I just say one thing though? Sure, Versify sure. and your team, I still remember the call that we had with Margaret Ramo, Erica Turner, you, and your incredible art director, Whitney Lita Percone. You guys had so much vision. And I have to say, Margaret and Erica, they really reined us in because there are hundreds of suffragists. So what we really, I think the other thing we wanted to say is that, um, movements never happen in isolation, that movements are always crossing each other. So we tried to choose 12 women who really represent the intersectionality of movements. So people like Native American rights activist, Sikala Sa, Mabel Pingwa Lee, who was a 16 year old son who led a parade, one of the largest parades in suffrage history in 1916 or 1918, but don't judge me, I can't remember the second, um, but, she led the suffrage parade, even though the Chinese Exclusion Act meant that she herself, as a Chinese American woman, would not be able to vote to the 1940s. Like these are women, young women, who dreamed further and farther than themselves. And that is such a beautiful thing. So we narrowed it down and we told 12 stories, but the book has lots of images. We created a playing deck card deck of um, 52 suffragists. And we even have, your team helped us create um, a PDF that families and teachers and librarians can print and make like a playing card deck and write f facts. I'm just excited, Kwame. I'm sorry, I'm so, I'm so nerding out right now. <laughs> no, this is great. The thing is, I'm just curious. When, when, well, first of all, let me say this to add on to your preface, and that is, when I found out that we had a shot to, to get this book and to be able to work with you, I was like, it's a, we got to make this happen. Like, we've got to do this, you know? Thanks. And so I'm just honored and blessed that, that you came on board to, to do this and you trusted us with this vision because, yeah, Margaret and Erica are, are, are geniuses or genius. What's the plural of genius? I don't know. <laughs> I know. You should know that. We're writerly. We have I no know. idea. <laughs> I know. Um, and so here's what I'm curious about. Um, so, so thank you for, for, for working with Versify. And what I'm curious about is why children? Why did you decide this needed to be a book for kids? Um, 
I know you, you've written for children and you've done it well, but why this book? Well, we really wanted to tell a story that made one, made voting rights come alive. You know, we're, we're, it's not only the 100th anniversary of suffrage, we're in a voting year and voting remains low among young people. And the thing is, is that if you read this book, you'll understand they didn't want to give women the vote because the vote is power. There's a reason why they had to fight for 150 years. It's because your vote is not something to be thrown away. It is like money in the bank. It is your future. It's your quality of life. It's how your neighbors live, your family, your parents, your friends. And that is your vote. And we really just wanted to show that generations of women fought for this and you should prize it no matter what your political views are. That's the thing is that your vote, we're not saying vote this way, vote that way, be a feminist, be not. That's not what it's all about. It's really interesting because the women don't all agree politically, but they all agree that they should have a voice. And that's what this book is about. Wonderful. So uh, quite a few of our, our almost 2000 people who are watching it. Yeah, we're about to shut down Zoom. So many people, we're yeah. shutting down the internet. Um, quite a few people have questions. So Margo, I don't know if I can say last names, Lisa or Amanda, so I'm just gonna say first names. Margo says um, that she's, she loves listening to us talk right now, but she's so focused on the picture behind you. Like she finds it so powerful and captivating. So you gotta tell us, give us yeah. the story. Yeah, so I collect photography and um, for the same reason that I love history is I love for my home to be filled with like images of people. So there's a great photographer named Jillian Lau. And I read about her because she did a story in the New York Times Magazine about segregated proms. And the pictures of that just broke my heart. So I reached out to her. I wanted to do a project with her. I still haven't yet, but maybe one day. And um, so, you know, when you meet with photographers, they bring stuff. And in her portfolio, she had these pictures of boys in, the, um, in South Africa. And so these are schoolboys in South Africa singing. And what I love is that she took their faces singing, but I don't know if you can see it, but then she took their feet dancing. And uh -huh. It kind of reminds me to sing and dance every day or try. So Jillian Loud, she's really special. That, that just really speaks to, to black joy. Yeah. You know, to, to, to the beauty of blackness and something we all gotta be reminded of um, we don't often talk about that when we talk about Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. We talk about the pain and the tragedy mm -hmm. and, 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 and the oppression and the conflict and the tension and all those things are necessary mm -hmm. because they're real. Right. But we also got to remember that, like Langston said, you know, we got to laugh to keep from crying. Yeah. Also, like I that's just, important. Yeah. I feel like as someone who came to the U.S., and had to learn a lot about Black American history, it is a masterclass in resilience and endurance and creativity and the improvisation of life. And so, you know, this has been a hard year and, you know, there are all these memes about how hard a year it is, but, you know, I, on one of the hardest days that I was having reading the news, a friend sent me a poem to go back to the voting rights, to go back to the suffragists that June Jordan wrote about Fannie Lou Hamer. And mm -hmm. she talked about how um, there's this great line where, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer had a target on her back. People wanted to kill her because she was fighting for people to vote. So that's what our vote means. And in the poem, she says that Fannie Lou Hamer is making dinner for all these young activists. And she stands at the door and she goes, bullets or no bullets, the food is ready and it's getting cold. And she said that, <laughs> They ate and they were tremulous and fortified. And, um, and I think about that, it's kind of been my grace at dinner every night, just as I make dinner and share meals with my family. I'm like, it may be scary out there, but think of Fannie Lou Hamer, think of June Jordan, think of your poetry. I, I read Undefeated on a regular basis, like I think probably four times a year, if not six times a year. I mean, your words, your poetry, that's, that's nourishment for our spirits, for our souls. And I just feel like people should look to black culture for that. That's, that's the gift we've given this country and the world. I mean, you're so right. 
thank you for those kind words. Nikki Giovanni says that if America wants to know how to, to find its soul, to, to find its smile, to find its humanity, to, to secure its hope, I'm paraphrasing. If you, if you want to, to find your humanity, turn to Black people. Because yes. Black people were taken from their land, had no idea where they were going, no idea where they were going to end up. And mm -hmm. once they got there, they still figured out a way to survive, and not only survive, but thrive. Right. And we don't carry hatred in our hearts. Nope. I mean, I remember the first time I was in college, and someone used the N-word at me in a like intellectual, this is my freedom of speech. And I called my mom and I was like, you know, I can't with these people. And she's like, we don't do that. We don't do these people. It's that person. We don't generalize the actions of individuals and we lead with like love and hope because that's what makes you strong. Everything else is gonna make you weak. And I feel like that's how black people do. If you're just tuning in, we are talking with Veronica Chambers, who has, Amanda, can we put the book on the screen really quickly, please? Who is sharing with us um, information and inspiration and insight about her forthcoming book from Versify called Finish the Fight, which is, um, the tagline is, or the subtitle is, the brave and revolutionary women who fought for their right to vote. We've translated it here today. And it's, the, the translation is women who are badass political strategists, but they won't let us put that on the cover. But y'all remember that. All right, so I think one of our final questions before we uh, go to the next part of the program, Veronica, and this has really been amazing to be able to chat with you. And um, I'm just, again, I'm really humbled and, and honored to do this. Uh, Lois um, asked, what were some of the things that you learned as you researched this, this project that shocked you and that heartened you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think about people, like I'm looking at the cover, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She's known as a suffragist. She's known as these things. I'm trying to think. There's actually two things about her. One is that she had a bus incident similar to Rosa Parks in the 1800s. And it was a huge case that made national news. She refused to get off the bus. And they were like, you have to get off. And she said, I, and because she was sitting in the front, she goes, I will not go to the back and I will ride until I'm ready to get off. And, um, and to think, you know, the bus, we think about Rosa Parks as being solitary, but one of the things you learn, I learned in doing that I worked with and these amazing illustrators is that individuals don't make movements, people make movements. So it's, it's hundreds of women from Frances Ellen Watkins Harper to Rosa Parks that makes the Rosa Parks moment a big bang. And I think that's really interesting. I think um, learning about queer women and really that was an interesting conversation to realize that while a lot, very few I think of the women in the suffrage movement would have called themselves queer, the idea that the freedom to love who you want to love is intrinsically tied up in the freedom of being a woman who can vote. Because if you can't vote, you have no voice in who you love, where you live, where you go to school, what you own, who you become, everything. It's the key that unlocks the door to your possibility. Unlock the door to your possibility this fall vote. Unlock the door to your imagination on August 18th and by Finish the Fight yes. by Veronica Chambers and the staff for the New York Times. Quickly, shout out some of your collaborators, folks who worked on this project. Sure, so there's amazing illustrators, Shama Golden, Rochelle Baker, we love all of them. Um, and also Jenny Schusler, Amy Padnani, who created Overlook. And I'll also say that the New York Times is staging a stage play on August 18th based on the book. And so um, there'll also be a live event that's going to be amazing. Y'all so. ain't ready Thank for this. You, Tommy. Thank you, Veronica. It's coming out, y'all. August 18th, middle grade and up. Finish the fight. It's our responsibility to do that. Thank you, Veronica Chambers. Thank you all for checking us out. We will turn this back over to the powers that be.
Please specify. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Kwame and Veronica, for joining us. I, I don't even know how I follow that up. I guess now I have something in common with James Patterson, which is kind of cool because I am also sad that I have to go after Kwame. Um, but Taylor and I are excited to share a lot of books with you today, starting with the other Versify titles. So I hope you stick around for the ride. So the first book I, I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to continue this high with Last Mirror on the Left by Lamar Giles. This is one of my absolute favorite books on the list. I, ab I honestly wanted this book to be twice as long. I never get tired of Lamar's inventiveness. So in this new legendary Alston boys adventure, Otto and Sheed must embark on their most dangerous journey yet, their own version of Through the Looking Glass. Unlike the majority of Logan County's residents, Mrs. Nidra of the Aurora Mere Emporium remembers the time freeze from the first Alston boys book, The Last Last Day of Summer, and how Otto and she took her mirrors full of dangerous criminals without permission to fix their own mess. Usually that's an unforgivable offense punishable by a million year sentence. However, she's willing to overlook the cousin's misdeeds if they help her with a problem of her own. One of her worst prisoners has escaped and only the legendary Alston boys can bring the fugitive back. Otto and Sheed plunge into the many mirror worlds that Mrs. Nidra oversees through a water world and a warped world and many more. But justice in this case might not be what the boys first think and completing their task may ask more than they're willing to give. Lamar examines questions of justice, the snap judgments we make and what we owe to each other all wrapped up in a hilarious and original story. Do not miss this book. Hi everyone, I'm Taylor. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about Anya and the Nightingale by Sophia Pasternak. The adventure continues in this exciting sequel to Anya and the Dragon in which a dangerous monster lurks beneath the city and only Anya can keep him from taking her friend's magic and their lives. It's been a year since a violent Viking terrorized Anya's small village, and Anya and her foolish friend Ivan saved a friendly dragon from being sacrificed for his magic. But things still aren't safe in the kingdom of Kievan Ruth. After embarking on a journey to bring her papa home from war, Anya discovers a powerful forest creature terrorizing travelers. But soon she learns that he's not the only monster the kingdom should fear. There's an even greater evil that lurks under the city. Can Anya stop the monster, save her papa, and find her way home? Or, or will the secrets of Kiev leave Anya and her friends trapped beneath the city forever? The Year I Flew Away by Marie Arnold. It's 1985 and 10-year-old Gabrielle is excited to be moving from Haiti to America. Unfortunately, her parents won't be able to join her yet and she'll be living in a place called Brooklyn, New York with relatives she has never met. She promises her parents that she will behave, but life proves difficult in the United States, from learning the language to always feeling like she doesn't fit in to being bullied. So when a persuasive witch offers her a chance to speak English and be a perfect American, she makes the deal, even though she knows that witches can't be trusted. But soon she realizes how much of herself she has given up by trying to fit in. And along with her two new friends, one of which is a talking rat, she takes on the witch in an epic battle to try to reverse the spell. Gabrielle is a funny and engaging heroine you won't soon forget in this sweet and lyrical novel that's perfect for fans of Hurricane Child and Front Desk. In Vivian McInerney's playful debut, readers will fall in love with wonder again as Zia imagines what might happen if the hole in her pocket became big enough to fall right through. The whole, whole story is perfect for readers looking for a fresh take on the classic Harold in the Purple Crayon. Zia is used to the hole in her pocket. She frequently fills it with frogs and other objects. And as it gets bigger and bigger, she starts to wonder what might happen if she fell right through. Would she cover it with a blanket to catch an elephant or dig a tunnel to the other side of the world? The possibilities are endless and readers will love following Zia's adventurous imagination from beginning to end. 
So Kwame mentioned our Versify books that won awards this year, but we had others as well that we wanted to mention. So congratulations to Lori Alexander and Vivian Mildenberger for their cyber honor for All in a Drop and to Victoria Ortiz for her Sydney Taylor Young Adult Honor for Dissenter on the Bench. So I, we're mostly focusing on fall titles today, but we do have a few spring that we just couldn't resist telling you about as well. First is Two What's and a Wow by Mindy Thomas and Guy Raz. From the creators of the number one kids podcast, Wow in the World, comes an activity book based on their daily game show, Two What's and a Wow. Choose between three unbelievable science statements to identify the true wow factor from the fallacies, and then learn the why and how behind the wow. But that's not all. After each round, tackle a STEAM-based challenge using a few household items and a lot of creativity, and discover even more science fun in the sidebars which are filled with brain bursting facts and figures, packed with wow in the world, signature family friendly humor and fascinating science facts. Two what's in a wow, Tinker, Think and Tinker Playbook will provide hours of learning, laughs and wows. Hey, and here are some other spring titles. ACT is the funny and honest follow up to the middle school graphic novel sensations Click and Camp. New York Times bestselling author, illustrator, Kayla Miller, crafts a genuine and inspiring story about evolving friendships, supportive family, and finding out that you, yes you, have the power to make a difference. In A Place at the Table by Sadia Farouk and Laura Chauvin, um, it's, a beautifully, it's a beautifully written story exploring themes of food, friendship, family, and what it means to belong, featuring sixth graders Sarah, a Pakistani American, and Elizabeth, a white Jewish girl taking a South Asian cooking class taught by Sarah's mom. In Running by Natalia Sylvester, when 15-year-old Cuban-American Mariana Ruiz's father runs for president, Mari starts to see him with whole new eyes. A novel about waking up and standing up and what happens when you stop seeing your dad as your hero while the whole country is watching. And finally, Igniting Darkness by Robin Lefevers. Two assassins will risk absolutely everything, even their own divinity, to save the people in the country they love in this lush historical fantasy from New York Times bestselling author Robin Lefevers. Set in the world of the beloved His Fair Assassin series, the smart, sensational follow-up to Courting Darkness is perfect for fans of Leigh Bardugo and Holly Black. And now on to fall 2020 picture books. A new David Wiesner book is always a big moment, just like a new baby's arrival is a big moment in any family, even a family of robots. Three-time Caldecott medalist David Wiesner captures the excitement and fanfare when Baby Flange appears as a crate full of components. Unfortunately, these robot parents aren't the best at assembly and have to call in all their neighbors and relatives to see if they can manage to put this baby together. Big sister Kath is sure she could help, but is ignored until she has no choice and seizes her chance along with the help of her robot dog, to put things right when the growing crowd of adults prove they aren't up to the task. A shout out for girl scientists and makers, Robo Baby is an eye-opening and engaging blend of the familiar and the fantastic. It's election day and Curious George is ready to cast his bow. On election day at the elementary school, Curious George and his friend, the man with the yellow hat, are visiting just in time to see the kids voting for their new school mascot. George can't resist getting in on the fun. He learns about the candidates, collects campaign stickers, and casts a lot of ballots. But what will happen when his hijinks start to get in the way of the vote? And who will win the big election? Find out in this new title about everyone's favorite monkey. Nothing in Common by Kate Hofler, illustrated by Karina Lukin. Two neighbors both love to watch the old man and his dog from their windows, but they never wave to each other. After all, they have nothing in common. But what might change when they are the only ones who notice that one day something is different? There's the old man, but where's the dog? 
As these two neighbors set out on their own separate journeys to find the dog, they slowly come together and find maybe they do have something in common after all, like caring about someone else. In this lyrical and absolutely beautiful picture book, two strangers learn about the many ways the world connects us if only we walk outside our own door and try. Filled with whimsy and warmth, Nothing in Common is a tender friendship story that reminds us to always lead with compassion. Speaking of beautiful picture books, Starcrossed by Julia Dino. A resonant story of two friends trying to maintain their relationship from afar with dazzling results, filled with wishes, curiosity, and bravery from award-winning author-illustrator Julia Dino. She was made of blood and bones, and he was made of space and stars. Back in the time when there were still students of the stars, there were two friends, Akamar and Eridani. Eridani was a star pupil studying the night sky, and Akamar, well, he was made of the stuff she studied. In a star-crossed twist of fate, these long-distance friends find they've wished themselves into unexpected new worlds. So with Stardust and Moonglow, this cosmic adventure shows us how even the most br brilliant wishes can have a mind of their own and that true friendship can endure despite time and space. Coming a good creature. School is not the only place to find a teacher. Acclaimed nature writer Cy Montgomery has had many teachers in her life, some with two legs, others with four or even eight. But they've all had one thing in common, a lesson to share. The animals Sai has met, both at home and on her many world travels, have taught her how to seek understanding in the most surprising ways, from being patient, to finding forgiveness, to respecting others. Gorillas, dogs, octopuses, tigers, and more all have shown Sai that there are no limits to the empathy and joy we can find in each other if only we take the time to connect. Based on the New York Times best-selling adult memoir, Cy Montgomery and Rebecca Green's beautiful, friendly guide is for readers young and old who wish to be better creatures in the world. The Suitcase by Chris Naylor Ballesteros. A powerful story about immigration, trust, and new beginnings full of heart and humanity for anyone who has ever felt unwelcome or out of place. Perfect for fans of Alan Say, Francesca Sana, and Yui Morales. When a wary stranger arrives one day with only a suitcase, everyone is full of questions. Why is he here? Where has he come from? And just what is in that suitcase? To learn the answers, they can either trust the newcomer or discover why they risk, what they risk by not believing him. The story about hope and kindness truth and perception, and most importantly, about how we treat those in need. So my next book is Lewis, and I personally think this is the funniest book on the list. So while I could explain the humor to you and tell you how charming the illustrations are, I thought instead I would just read you the book. So this is Lewis by Tom Lichtenheld, illustrated by Julie Rowan Zock. From day one, things have gone downhill. I've been a pillow, a hanky, and lunch for a prehistoric beast. I've been buried alive, thrown into a hurricane, and hung out to dry. I've been left to the mercy of wild animals, poked by needles, and made an accessory to a crime. I've been x-rayed, milk sprayed, and mislaid. I can bear it no longer. The next time this kid squeezes me, I'm out of here. 
Well, no sense running away in the rain. But as soon as little sister wraps up this tea party, I'm packing my bags. Meanwhile, I need to build up my strength for the getaway. Seriously, right after we do our show and tell routine, I'm history. I know, I know, we're awesome. Okay, this is perfect. The minute the lights go out, I'm off like a dirty shirt, making like a tree and leaving. Okay, now. Come on, Lewis, you silly bear. On second thought, a bear could do worse. The end. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda, for that wonderful reading of Lewis, one of my favorite picture books of the season. Um, so now we're moving on to a couple chapter books that are illustrated. So not quite picture books, not quite in the middle grade category. First is Sydney and Taylor by Jacqueline Davies. Best-selling author Jacqueline Davies of the Lemonade War series tells the story of two unlikely friends, Sydney and Taylor, a skunk and a hedgehog who strike out to discover the great unknown, despite how afraid they are of it. Charming full-color illustrations and a laugh-out-loud story make this chapter book perfect for fans of the Mercy Watson and Owl Diaries series. Sydney is a skunk and Taylor is a hedgehog, but no matter how odd the pairing may seem, their friendship comes naturally. They live happily in their cozy burrow until the day Taylor gets his big idea to go see the whole wide world. From mountains taller than a hundred hedgehogs, valleys wider than a thousand skunks, to the dangers that lie in the human world, Sydney and Taylor wanted to see it all. With a map and a dream, they bravely set off, soon discovering that the world is much bigger than they realized. A Long Road on a Short Day by Gary Schmidt and Elizabeth Stickney, illustrated by Eugene Yelchin. A tender story of a father and son adventure with themes of community and kindness in short chapters with vivid full color illustrations by Newbery Honor winner Gary Schmidt and acclaimed artist Eugene Yelchin, who also happens to be a Newbery Honor winner. In a story of perseverance and determination told with warmth and sparkling with humor, a short winter day finds Samuel and Papa walking down a long road on Samuel's first trading trip. Meeting strangers, practicing good manners, and proud to be in Papa's company, Samuel watches and learns as Papa trades up from a knife all the way to the milk cow Mama is yearning for. Samuel, who has longingly played with all the pets he has encountered throughout the day, might just get his own surprise at the end as well. Simple text combined with vivid illustrations for a satisfying tale that will resonate with readers who enjoy an adventure with dad. And now we're on to middle grade with a special guest to tell us about our first book. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa DeSaro, Executive Director of Marketing, and I'm thrilled to tell you about our next middle grade novel, Just Like That, by Newbery Honor winner Gary Schmidt. If you've read Gary's best-selling and award-winning books, The Wednesday Wars and OK For Now, you may recognize some of the names and characters in this book. Describing just like that isn't easy. I'll start by telling you that it's set in the 60s and we find one of our main characters, Meryl Lee Kowalski, has just arrived at a girls' boarding school. The other main character is a homeless boy, Matt Coffin, who's on the run from a complicated past. Gary Schmidt expertly weaves multi-layered plot strands and themes into a compelling and satisfying read with a wide emotional range. 
It's a book that will make you feel every emotion. It's at times sad, happy, suspenseful, funny, tender, and hopeful. It's complicated, a bit like life, which is part of why I think it's so successful. Gary Schmidt doesn't shy away from the difficult emotions people struggle with day in and day out. And um, in doing that, he's created an incredibly memorable and touching story, one that will really make you both laugh and cry. The title describes a moment when something happens and just like that, everything changes. Like when someone unexpectedly dies or your parents decide you're going to boarding school or you meet someone special. In this story, all those things happen, but at its heart, the story is about growth and change, the opposite of just like that. What it means to grieve and recover from grief, adjusting to new surroundings, becoming educated both in the classroom and by life, getting to know people even when the way that they appear isn't really who they are, figuring out who you are and who you want to become. Like the characters in this book, middle grade readers are living some of these experiences. And I think they'll benefit greatly from reading this story and getting to know the special characters within. I know I did. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, so much for that. It was, um, it makes me really excited for everyone to read this book and have the same experience you did. So next we have The Puppet's Payback and Other Chilling Tales by Mary Downing Hahn, which might be her creepiest book yet, but just so you know how creepy it is, we have to watch the trailer. <laughs> She was orphaned and sick when she was first brought to me. To me to follow. Up I think the YouTube video the first like time that. I held Jemima J in my hands, I knew I was tying in. Um, thank you. All right, Vanderbeekers Lost and Found. New York Times bestseller Karina Jan Glazer brings everyone's favorite Harlem family back in this poignant fourth novel in the delightful and heartwarming, that's according to the New York Times book review, I don't just think that, Vanderbeeker series. When Autumn arrives on 141st Street, the Vanderbeekers are busy helping their upstairs neighbor, Mr. Biederman, get ready for the New York City Marathon and making sure that the mysterious person sleeping in the community garden gets enough to eat. But when the Vanderbeekers discover that the, this mystery person is none other than their friend, Orlando, their world is turned upside down as they learn what it means to care for someone in an impossible situation. And a further challenge for the Vanderbreakers may not be far behind. And as valiant as they are, this one might not be possible for them to win. This entry in the series is as sweet as ever, but with an even greater depth. The Vanderbreakers are the kind of family that I think most of us wish we were a part of. Charming, funny, and caring. They never stop trying to make the world around them a better place. And I know I benefit from their hearts every time I read one of these books. Please keep them coming, Karina. Secrets of the Silver Lion by Emma Ategi. From the best bustling streets of New York City to the cobblestones of Seville and the silver mines high in the Andes Mountains of Bolivia, Carmen is off on another quest to stop vile in, a, in this original Carmen San Diego novel inspired by the Netflix show. For centuries, the magnificent throne of Felipe has stood with two empty spaces beside its famous silver arrow, spaces where the silver castle and lion should have been. And now, with the recent discovery of the silver castle within a secret vault in Seville, Spain, the hunt is on. The throne will be, sorry, um, had a techno, technical glitch there. Um, with all three pieces in the place, the throne will be enormously valuable.
files and radar. Um, sorry, <laughs> some mic issues. Now it's up to Carmen and crew to find the silver lion before Vile does and protect the throne from winding up in the wrong hands. And then on the next slide, we have the other Carmen San Diego titles that are currently available. No Place for Monsters by Corey Merritt. Nothing ever seems out of place in the safe suburban town of Cowslip Grove. Lawns are neatly mowed, sidewalks are tidy, and the sounds of ice cream trucks fill the air. Well, that is an ice cream truck, right? But now kids have been going missing, except no one even realizes it because no one remembers them. Not their friends, not their teachers, not even their families. But our heroes, Levi and Kat, do remember. And suddenly only they can see why everyone is in terrible danger when the night air rolls in. Now it is up to Levi and Kat to fight and save the missing kids before that evil swallows the town whole if they can find their courage and get along long enough to do it. In this spell-binding, lavishly illustrated story that the Diary of the Wimpy Kid, author Jeff Kinney calls wildly imaginative and totally terrifying, two unlikely friends face down their worst fears in order to stop their small town and themselves from disappearing. Maya in the Rising Dark by Rena Barron. 12-year-old Maya is the only one in her Southside Chicago neighborhood who witnesses weird occurrences like were hyenas stalking the streets at night and a scary man made of shadows plaguing her dreams. When Papa goes missing, Maya is thrust into a world both strange and familiar as she uncovers the truth. Her father is the guardian of the veil between our world and the dark, where an army led by the Lord of Shadows awaits. Maya herself is a godling, half Arisha and half human, and her neighborhood is a safe haven. But now that the veil is failing, the Lord of Shadows is determined to destroy the human world, and it's up to Maya to stop him. She just hopes she can do it in time to attend Comic-Con before summer's over. Kirkus calls it a truly hashtag black girl magic, cloudy day, curl up kind of book in their starred review, and we can't wait for you to experience the magic yourself. The Willoughby's Return. From living legend and Newbery medalist Lois Lowry comes a hilarious sequel to the New York Times bestseller, The Willoughby's, which is now an animated movie on Netflix, so you should definitely check that out. In The Willoughby's, the Willoughby children were abandoned when their parents went off to the Alps and froze solid. Fortunately for the kids, after a number of adventures, they ended up adopted by a billionaire candy company owner. Doesn't get much better than that. But now it's 30 years later, and the original Willoughby children, now adults, and their children are in trouble once more. For one thing, Candy has been declared illegal, and their business is in trouble. And their parents have thawed due to global warming. And if they think their problems are bad, it's nothing compared to their thawed progenitors who have no idea what to do in this strange world of Uber and Google. What is the point of being the son of a billionaire when your father no longer is a billionaire? What is a future without candy in it? And is there any escaping the odiousness of the elder Willoughby's? These are the pro profound questions we all must grapple with in the Willoughby's return. Okay. Uh, the New York Times bestselling author of Max is back with two more American dog books. Chesna is a dog without a family. After being abandoned in the wild, Chesna is wandering the North Carolina countryside trying to survive. When 12-year-old Meg stumbles upon him on the outskirts of her family's Christmas tree farm, she just knows that they're meant to be together forever. The only problem? The farm is on the brink of closing down and her family can't afford a pet. Meg knows she has what it takes to save the business and take care of Chestnut. She'll just need to keep him a secret until then. Will Meg and Chestnut get their Christmas miracle? And Star, a deaf Australian shepherd, is brought to a local shelter after her elderly owner passes away. Star feels scared and alone until she meets 12-year-old Julian. 
After getting in trouble at school yet again, Julian volunteers at the shelter and realizes how he can communicate with Star in a way that no one else can. Their bond continues to grow and Julian and Star become inseparable. Then the unthinkable happens. Funding for the shelter dries up. The only way to save Star is to adopt her, but he has to prove that he can stay out of trouble and train a dog like Star. Will Julian and Star find a way to stay together forever? The Raconteur's Commonplace Book is a new standalone mystery set in the world of the best-selling Green Glass House series from National Book Award nominee and Edgar-winning author Kate Milford. The rain hasn't stopped for a week, and the 12 guests of the Blue Vein Tavern are trapped by flooded roads and the rising Skid Rack River. To pass the time, the guests begin to tell stories, each a different type of folklore, that eventually reveal more about their own secrets than they might have intended. Think a type of Canterbury tale story full of magic and mystery. As the rain continues to pour down an uncanny, unnatural amount of rain, the guests begin to realize that the entire city is in danger and not just from the flood. But they only have their stories and one another to save them. Will it be enough? I love Kate Milford's special flavor of storytelling, which feels like it comes from a world maybe just next to ours. The individual short stories fascinated me, and I loved seeing them come together as a whole. I think this is one I will be reading again. We're going to let our colleague Anna tell you about this next book. I hope. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anna Ravenel, and I am a publicity associate at HMH. I'm so excited to get to talk to you today about The Deepest Breath by Meg Rahan. This beautiful novel in verse follows 11-year-old Stevie, who knows a lot of things about a lot of things, because knowing things makes her feel safe and in control. And with her mom's help, she's finding the tools to manage her anxiety. But one thing Stevie doesn't know, and something she isn't ready to share with her mom yet, is the meaning of that fizzy feeling in her chest that she gets when she thinks about her friend Chloe. So Stevie sits off on her own to figure it out. This book truly is something for everyone. A nuanced depiction of anxiety, a lovely relationship between a single mother and her child, a librarian who comes to the rescue, and a sweet early exploration of identity. This is one of my absolute favorite titles on our upcoming list and an absolute must read. Just make sure you have tissues nearby when you read it. Thank you. Hi. So next we have another special guest to tell you about our new print imprint etch. Hi everyone, um, I'm Amelia Rhodes and I'm the editorial director of Etch, which is HMH's new graphic novel imprint. This imprint came to be out of editorial and the editorial and design team's passion for graphic novels and comics and the community that creates them. It's been a real labor of love, so I'm excited to tell you about our inaugural list today. Etch has graphic novels that make a mark for every reader of all ages. First up, uh, we have Dynamity, which is written by Doug Paleo with art by Aaron Blicka. The young middle grade graphic novel for all the jokesters, um, featuring a modern take on dinosaurs and full of colorful art, a light mystery, and a really heavy dose of puns. This one is perfect for reluctant readers and fans of Dogman. And a good companion to the prehistoric era is new detective on the scene, Sherlock Bones and the Natural History Mystery with text and art by Renee Trammell. This is a younger middle grade graphic novel as well with a stolen, a classic stolen gem mystery full of all the fun characters who might come to life in the Natural History Museum once the lights go out, including this very adorable and rambunctious raccoon. <laughs> For the gamer in your life, Power Up, written by Sam Neeson, with art by Darnell Johnson, brings the visual storytelling of graphic novels and video games together in an action-packed boy friendship story. 
Two gamers who are best friends in the virtual world don't realize that they actually go to the same middle school until a big gaming convention puts the friends at odds. Next, for the older middle grade reader who can't quite pick between Rick Riordan or Raina Telgemeier, or perhaps has already blown through them both, we have Oh My Gods, uh, written by Stephanie Cook and Insha Fitzpatrick, with art by Juliana Moon. This is the story of Karen, a seemingly normal girl from New Jersey who learns her father is Zeus and has to start life all over again at Mount Olympus Junior High. It's not so easy living up to these demigods and goddesses. And for every curious and wannabe hero at heart, we have Timo the Adventurer by Jonathan Garnier and Johan Sacra. Timo has read every book in his village and decides it's time to write his own story, but discovers that saving the day is a little bit more complicated than he thought. And to round out our first etch list is Ichiro by Ryan and Zana, an Eisner nominated YA graphic novel that will be available in paperback for the first time. And another's Carmen Sandiego adventure in graphic novel form, The Chasing Paper Paper. And that's it for etch. Back to you, Taylor and Amanda. Great, and we're to our last category, young adult. The Ravens by Cass Morgan and Danielle Page. From New York Times bestselling authors Cass Morgan and Danielle Page comes a thrilling dark contemporary fantasy about a prestigious sorority of witches and two girls caught up in its world of sinister magic and betrayal. At first glance, the sisters of ultra-exclusive Kappa Rho Nu, the Ravens, seem like typical sorority girls. Ambitious, beautiful, and smart, they're the most powerful girls on Westerly College's Savannah, Georgia campus. But the Ravens aren't just regular sorority girls, they're witches. Scarlet Winter has always known she's a witch, and she's determined to be the sorority's president, just like her mother and sister before her. But if a painful secret from her past ever comes to light, she could lose absolutely everything. B.B. Devereaux has no idea she's a witch, and she's never lived in one place long enough to make a friend. So when she gets a coveted bid to pledge the Ravens, she vows to do whatever it takes to be part of the magical sisterhood. The only thing standing in her way is Scarlet, who doesn't think B.B. is Ravens material. When a dark power rises on campus, the girls want to put their rivalry aside to save their fellow sisters. Someone has discovered the Raven's secret and that someone will do anything to see these witches burn. Greythorn by Crystal Smith. Brimming with deliciously mysterious magic, political intrigue, and a passionate heroine who will do anything to save those she loves, this highly anticipated sequel to Bloodleaf, praised as enchanting, visceral, and twisty by Laura Sebastian, won't disappoint. After the tumultuous events of Bloodleaf, Princess Aurelia thought that the evil had been defeated and she could return her brother to his throne in peace. But her life is upended once again when the kingdom she thought she saved falls to ruin, a loved one is tragically killed in a shipwreck, and her home country turns against her. But with no place to call her own, Aurelia returns to Greythorn Manor, her best friend's family mansion, only to find that Greythorn has sinister secrets of its own. With enemies closing in on all sides, Rulia is caught in a mad fight to protect the only people she has left, her family. In her darkest moment, when all seems grim, will Rulia find a spark of hope from a love she thought long lost? Divided Fire by Jennifer San Filippo. In a rich fantasy world where songs literally move heaven and earth, one sister must use magic and the other must rely on strength to reunite when pirates, greed, and war tear them away from each other. Mirren has never allowed jealousy of her sister's magic to keep her from taking care of Kessia, and Kessia has always depended on her big sister. When Kessia is kidnapped, Mirren will do anything to get her back even team up with her sister's aristocratic and seemingly ineffectual boyfriend. Neither sister had ever left their small fishing village before, and now they are plunged into the wider world, minor players in a war between nations. Each sister faces external and internal perils, and each finds surprising allies and unexpected strengths. 
How will the two find each other again? And what will become of them if they don't succeed? Curse of the Divine. In Ink in the Blood, Celia San and her best friend Anya fled the corrupt religion of Propheta into the refuge of the rabble mob, a traveling theater group. Celia and Anya used their tattoo magic to create their own act in the mob and as a rebellion against the goddess of Propheta, Divalia, whose tattoos, whose will the tattoos are supposed to reveal. Only they hadn't reckoned with the evil goddess coming after them herself. Though Cecilia and Anya were able to defeat Divalia with the help of their rabble friends, the price was high, maybe too high. In Curse of the Divine, the survivors must find a way to live with their guilt and find a way to destroy Divalia once and for all as she resurfaces more wrathful than ever. The key to destroying Divalia may lie with a man named Halcyon, the only other person to have faced Divalia and survived. But Halcyon is dangerous and has secrets of his own, ones that may involve the ink that Celia has come to hate. Forced to, forced to choose between the ink and Devalia, Celia will do whatever it takes to save her friends, even if it means making a deal with the devil himself. Return to the world of inklings, tattoo magic, and evil deities as Celia uncovers the secrets of the ink in order to stop Devalia once and for all. When Villains Rise by Rebecca Schaefer. Dexter meets Victoria Schwab in this dark and compelling fantasy about a girl who is determined to take down the black market once and for all in the conclusion to the Market of Monsters trilogy. Nita finally has Fabricio, the boy who betrayed her to the black market, within her grasp. But when proof that COVID Zanny, a monster who eats pain in order to survive, is leaked to the world, Nita must reevaluate her plan. With enemies closing in on all sides, the only way out is for Nita and Kovit to take on the most dangerous man in the world, Fabricio's father. He protects the secrets of the monsters who run the black market. Stealing those secrets could be the one thing that stands between Nita and Kovit and certain death in the thrilling conclusion to the trilogy that began with the critically acclaimed Not Even Bone. We are not free. Author Tracy Chee's previous New York Times bestselling series was fantasy, but in We Are Not Free, Tracy dives into her own family's history to share about the Japanese incarcerations of World War II. Tracy calls this book a novel in stories, as it follows 14 different teenagers through the beginning of the incarceration, their time in the camps, and their experiences afterwards. These teens have grown up together in Japantown, San Francisco, and are as interconnected as they are conflicted. Each of these teens are just trying to live their lives, playing baseball, having crushes, struggling with their parents, but against a backdrop of racism and injustice that threatens their lives and their futures. Well, I hope you're interested in all of the wonderful books that we've shared about today. If there was only one that I could ask you to pick up, it would be this one. Truly think it's one of those books that can change hearts and minds and make us think about what freedom and justice and being an American really means. I think you, like I did, will laugh and cry <laughs> and learn. It's a beautiful, heartbreaking, and necessary book, and I truly urge everyone to read it. Under Shifting Stars by Alexandra Lato. Audrey's best friend was always her twin, Claire. But as they got older, they grew apart, and when their brother Adam died, Claire blamed Audrey for the accident. Now Audrey is attending an alternative school where she feels more isolated than ever. Tired of being seen as different from her neurotypical peers, Audrey's determined to switch to the public high school, rebuild her friendship with Claire, and atone for Adam's death. But she'll need to convince her parents and her therapist first. Claire knows her sister thinks she's the perfect twin, but Audrey doesn't realize that Claire's popular status is crumbling. She's begun to question old friendships, dress in Adam's clothes, and wonder what feelings for non for wonder what feelings for a non-binary classmate Taylor might mean. As she's grappling with not only grief but also her gender fluidity, 
Claire wonders where she'll belong if she sheds her carefully constructed image and embraces her true self. Will First Crush's new family dynamics and questions of identity prove that Audrey and Claire have grown too different to understand each other or that they've needed each other all along? It Only Happens in the Movies by Holly Bourne. In this cool, smart British import, Audrey is over romance. While dealing with her parents' contentious divorce, shifting friendship dynamics, and an ugly breakup of her own that has caused her to walk away from the theater program that she loved, Audrey has every reason to feel cynical and depressed. But then she meets Harry, her fellow coworker at her new job at the local cinema. He's brash, impulsive, a major flirt, and wants her to star in the zombie movie he's making. And even though Audrey tries to resist, she, falls her, she finds herself falling for his charms as they make the movies and he helps her rediscover her love of performing. But can Harry keep his word and follow through on his promises? In this funny, insightful, and ultimately empowering novel, love and life isn't what it's like in the movies. We have one more video for you. It's from our coworker, Nadia, to tell you about some other now. Hi, my name is Nadia and I'm a marketing manager at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. I'm so excited to tell you about Some Other Now by Sarah Everett. This is a wonderful contemporary novel about Jessie, a girl caught between two brothers as the three of them navigate family, loss, and love over the course of two summers. This is one of my favorite upcoming books. I love how it jumps between two timelines, last summer and the present, so readers can piece together what happened. This book is beautifully written and explores universal themes of love and heartbreak, loss and guilt, friendship and family, the family you're born into and the ones you choose to be part of. It's definitely a book you won't want to miss and I hope you love it as much as I do. Thanks. we've reached the end. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please follow us on social media for news about even more great books. This isn't even our whole fall list. We couldn't share them all with you today. And make sure you check out the links there for eGalleys as well. You can also view this PowerPoint as mentioned at your leisure by downloading it. And then you can click on all the links for the guides and the videos. And as always, please feel free to email Taylor or myself with any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amanda, and a huge thank you to all of today's panelists. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, a certificate of completion, and a video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit www.booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones. If you haven't already, be sure to check out Booklist Reader, where Booklist contributors post daily about all things books and library land. Did you know that Booklist content is freely available to all until further notice? Start reading with our digital edition, a format that pairs the page-by-page -page reading experience of prints with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com. If you're interested in subscribing, you can take advantage of this special webinar offer to get print, online, digital, and archive access to Booklist for only $99. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. And one more huge thank you to our sponsor, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, Books for Young Readers. This concludes today's webinar. <laughs>